halted before the gate, briefly and then marched on, coming after a few minutes to another gate and another huge sign. This one read, Work makes life sweet. Stretching out from the gate on both sides were high walls with barbed wire above them, extending so far in both directions that I could see no end to them. Again, we were ordered to halt briefly and then marched, marched on beneath the gate. Beneath the sign promising us a pleasant life, we passed through the guards, hurrying us inside with their raised rifles, and the gate clanked shut behind us. We were lined up alongside a road, coming from the other end of the camp. The light had faded to a dull gray, but I could still make out the forms of women slowly dragging by on the road. Some of them were carrying buckets, some hoes. As I stared at them in the dim light, the women's pace seemed to slacken even more, their feet barely leaving the surface of the road. One foot moved forward, then the other, slowly, slowly. Heads drooped, arms hung loosely at their sides. When one group of women had passed, another began. Row after row, coming by, ever coming by. Women with green, red, or purple markings on their coat sleeves. Women barely more than children. Old women. This can't be true, I thought. I'm having another nightmare. When I wake up, this will be gone, and I'll be back on the train. Memoir of Sarah Tuval Bernstein. Ravensbrück Concentration Camp was the largest and only concentration camp for women. It was located 50 miles from Berlin. Operations began in May 1939 with the transfer of approximately 900 women from Lechtenburg, where a fortress had previously been used as a temporary camp. Ravensbrück was originally intended to hold and punish female political prisoners, but after Germany invaded Poland in 1939, transports began to arrive to the camp from Nazi-occupied territories. Women were issued color-coded triangles that classified them as either political prisoners, asocials, criminals, Roma, Sinti, Jew, or Jehovah's Witness. They were forced to work in different types of jobs, like heavy outdoor work, kitchen and administration, and at the Siemens Electrical Company. Women who arrived before 1944 were given a standard uniform, which was a dress with blue stripes, an apron, and a hat made out of the same material as the dress. They would be issued a number and a color triangle that would help the guards distinguish the prisoner so that they would be able to know how to treat them and why they were imprisoned. If a prisoner arrived in 1944 or 1945, she would no longer receive a standard uniform. She would be given a dress that had been taken from other prisoners. It would have a large X drawn in the middle of the front and back. Standard uniforms were no longer available since the camp was overcrowded. They would still be issued a number and a triangle, which they had to sew on one of the sleeves. These dresses became the great equalizer. Regardless of social background, the dresses were issued to everyone, no matter who you were. We were handed some rags to put on. Those pajamas, they were out of those, evidently. Tall girls got short coats and short dresses, and short girls got long ones. Olga Astor, Holocaust Survivor. Food was a constant companion. To try and alleviate the hunger, and to temporarily escape their imprisonment, women would cook by imagination. There are four surviving cookbooks, three of which were written by Jewish survivors. There is a possibility of there being more, since non-Jewish political prisoners would have had more chances to create them. One of the surviving cookbooks was created by Rebecca Bachman Tiedelbaum. She worked in the Siemens factory, where she had the opportunity to work the night shift, which was not as strictly supervised as the day shift. This gave her the chance to obtain some paper, which she cut into small pieces. In order to put it together, she sold some food for needle and thread. In the barracks, the women would share their favorite recipes, and Rebecca would write them down. She managed to compile 101 pages of recipes, which included pretty elaborate recipes, such as mousse au chocolat, gelée de croissier, ouf hollandais, sabouillon italien, crêpe, coco vin, and many more. During the night, you wouldn't believe it, how women, they talked continuously about recipes and foods. 
You would have thought that a French chef is there, you know? Julia Child doesn't know those recipes. Holocaust survivor, Olga Astor. Food served two purposes. It momentarily relieved their hunger and served as a form of resistance because they were not supposed to eat more than they were given. But many women risked their lives in defiance of this. Their resistance facilitated the formation of friendships because even though many women were starving, they decided to share their food when they could have kept it for themselves. It allowed them to maintain a sense of humanity in a place that was designed to make them feel less than human. Holocaust survivor Dora Van Bein had the opportunity to sell some potatoes one day at work. She was able to bring them back to the camp and her sister-in-law, Regina, gave some potatoes to one of the overseers in the camp because she had a pot and asked her to cook for them. Her quote follows, She, the barrack overseer, made a pot of soup full, almost to the top. She, Regina, gave this woman a large portion for cooking it for us and to the other women in the barracks who were around us. She rationed out the soup for her, for Hanka, my other sister-in-law, for me, the same amount as it was given to the other women. A small cupful of soup from all that big pot of soup. Because they sometimes, if they got something, they would share it with us. One day, I got very mad and said, what do I have to lose? They're going to kill us anyhow. I organized a few girls, went into the kitchen. I said, we need food to bring to the barrack, a kettle of food. And I stole a whole kettle of food and brought it into the barrack and everybody ate and that was the one time that we were full. When asked how she got the courage to do something like that, she responded, I don't know, because we didn't care. We knew we were going to get killed, so what's the difference if it's now or later? Holocaust survivor, Bella Amalek. <laughs>